This is part 3 in the series of creating a custom game lift server with Unity and enabling a Unity game client to connect to it. In the first two parts of this series, I covered how to integrate the game lift SDK into the game client and also how to launch a fleet with a Unity server build. If you haven't viewed them yet, I recommend going back and watching them first. They aren't very long. Also, if you're not familiar with Gamelift, check out the Intro to Gamelift link in the description. It'll help give you some context for the video. Amazon provides this diagram to outline all the important Gamelift API interactions for managing the entire lifecycle of a multiplayer game session. This video picks up from where the last one ended, continuing from the Start Game section. I'll review the Game Server column first, followed by the Client App column later in the video. Outside of the API interactions, the other big requirement for custom Gamelift servers is establishing a network connection between client and server. So we'll be reviewing an example project of how to do all that and also the required AWS console setup. The server project consists of two main scripts, Gamelift Server and Bad Network Server. The Gamelift Server script is a continuation of what was covered in the last video on Gamelift Server initialization. Here you can see we need to call init SDK and process ready. The start function calls the init SDK to establish a connection to the Gamelift agent, which is required to start things off. Then we pick a random port for the server to communicate on. For testing, you can hard code one, but it's best to have a different port for each game session so you don't have cross session communication problems. We set up the process parameters, which carries all of the callbacks defined below for the different Gamelift tasks. Set the port. Here you can list the files you want Gamelift to upload when the game session ends, like log files. I configured my fleet to store log files at this path, which I'll show you how to do later, so that's where this path comes from. I created the isprod flag so I can switch between production and local testing settings. You don't have to do it this way, but I felt it was easy for me to manage switching between different environments. Once process ready returns success, start our TCP server. The bad network server encapsulates all networking code. It uses telepathy, which is packaged as part of Mir. You can use whatever server you'd like for this, but telepathy just seemed easy to work with. More on that in a minute. These next few methods are the callback definitions set above in the process parameters object that were then passed into the process ready call. So for the on game session method, when a game session is created, call activate game session to market ready to receive player sessions. This is hit after the client successfully requests for a new game session as shown here in the diagram. On process terminate is what Gamelift calls before shutting down. I use this space to clean up the server and shut down the TCP server. Remove player session is used when a player needs to be removed from the game for whatever reason. Then to handle all the shutdown functionality, I created the finalized server process shutdown method. The current diagram says to use terminate game session, but the docs indicate it's deprecated and to use process ending in its place. So make sure you have all your game cleanup finished before this point then make a call to process ending to end the game session. Then make a call to application.quit after that, otherwise the Unity server will not shut down properly. And I make calls to finalize server process shutdown from these methods as well because they are also terminal points in the code. It may be overkill, but I wanted to make sure the game session and Unity server are shut down properly. Okay, on to the bad network server. We'll start at the bottom. We initialize our server callbacks. And here is the start TCP server function using the port we selected earlier. The on connect and disconnect callbacks are located here. So back up to the top, here we can see the telepathy server initialization, a dictionary to track player sessions, and access to the gameless server. The on data received method is where our messages from the player clients come in. We run all the messages through the process message function to determine what type of operation it is based on opcode. Currently there are only two opcodes, connect and W. Connect calls handle connect, which establishes the player into the game lift session with a call to accept player session. This will happen after the client requests to create a player session. Then we send a connected opcode response to the player, which is basically a thumbs up that our server and client are talking. Once the players are added to the session, they should show up in the AWS console under the game session tab. Then we check to see if the game is ready to start through this check and send game ready to start message method. It just checks if the game has the required player count to start. You can set this to whatever you'd like. Since this is a two player game, when the second player joins, we send both clients a start opcode to tell the Unity player clients to start the game. More on that later. For the W opcode, that means a player hit the W key. 
So the first to hit W after the game starts wins. That's, that's the complete game. We then call the check for game over method, which sends the win and lose opcodes to the respective winner and loser. So that means the game session is over. So after we send off the win lose messages, I remove both players from the session and then disconnect their TCP connection. Then we call this handle game end function, which performs the game lift shutdown procedures we discussed earlier. Finally, this end game after disconnect is a function I created to end the game when any player disconnects. So I go through the same process of removing players from the game session, disconnecting their TCP connection from the server, then performing the shutdown procedures through the handle game end call. You don't have to do it this way, meaning you don't have to end the game when someone disconnects. Maybe your game can replace that player instead of removing them. It's all about your game's requirements. Another thing, I had to set the API compatibility level under project settings player to .NET 4.x for the deserialization library to work. Head over to the AWS console and go to the build section under game lift. Use the instructions here to upload your build. I actually covered all of this in the previous video, so if you want to dig into this a little bit more, or if you're not sure what to do, go back and watch that last video. Select the build and hit create fleet from build. Name it and scroll down to server process allocation. Input the game name and launch parameters, then hit the green check mark. My launch parameters indicate the location of my log file and that this is a production build. The log file path needs to match the path we provided under the process parameters in the GameLift server script. The isProd flag is used throughout the project to ready it for an AWS deployment. Scroll down to the EC2 port settings and hit add port setting. My port range was 7000 to 8000 and allowed access from anywhere. As a quick note here, the client will receive the port and IP that it needs to connect to during the game session setup. More on that later. Hit Initialize Fleet. Once the fleet status hits Activating, it should take no more than about 5 minutes to go active. At that point, it is ready to receive game session requests from the client. If the status never changes to Active after about 10 minutes, there probably is an issue and you'll need to investigate. For this demo, I created a Cognito Identity Pool to allow for unauthenticated clients to join. That means you don't need to log in to use it. This is nice for getting started. This allows your Unity game client to access the game lift services right from the project. So go to the Cognito service under the AWS console and hit Manage Identity Pools. Name it. Then under Unauthenticated Identities, check the box next to Enable Access to Unauthenticated Identities. Hit Create Pool. On the next page, hit View Policy Document and hit the Edit for the Unauthenticated Identities. Paste in another Effect Allow block with the game lift actions to allow the Unity client access to those services. Then hit Allow. On the next screen, select Unity under Platform and take note of the Identity Pool ID as we'll be using it in our Unity client soon. This section will cover the client-side setup. So we have our server up and running, now we need to set up our Unity client to create game and player sessions and communicate with the server. Back in this diagram, we'll review all of the tasks under the client app column and how they tie into the game with server. We'll also look at an example implementation of how to set up the client side networking required to communicate with our server. So let's review the code and finish up with a demo game that shows the stages of a game session in the AWS console. Now on to the client project. This project is a continuation from the first video in this series as we loaded all of the required SDKs for GameLift. However, because I'm using AWS Cognito to authenticate requests, we still need to add a few more DLLs to allow our project to communicate with GameLift servers. From the AWS SDK DLL folder, copy over the following into your project's plugins folder, Cognito Identity, Cognito Sync, and Security Token. We also need the Newtonsoft.json DLL I just pulled this one from the GameLift Managed Servers SDK that we covered in the last video. The download links for both of these are in the description. Then we need to import telepathy which is packaged with Mirror. I just searched the asset store and added to my assets and then imported through the package manager. Then just hit import. Finally for our project setup, we also need to make sure the API compatibility level is set to .NET 4.x for the deserialization to work on this side. Okay, let's do a review of the client side code. This project is also made up of two main files, GameLift Client and Bad Network Client. 
For game with client, let's start with the constructor. We pick a unique UUID for the player that is required for creating game sessions. I just generate a random UUID for each player session as they are not to be reused. Next, let's take a look at the setup function. Here we make a call to create the game with client. This is where we use the identity pool ID that we established earlier. And then create our Amazon game with client. This client object is where we access all of the game lift APIs from. Then we kick off a search for active game sessions. So search game sessions async. There are several parameters you can configure to work for your project's requirements. Here I just get the oldest game session created where there's still a spot open for this player. If we don't find a game session, then we create one. So for create game session async, here is the same idea with the search. We have multiple parameters. You just have to provide the player UUID, max players along with the fleet ID. So now we have a game session either from our search or through creating one, and now we can add a player session to it. The create player session function. This is where we actually add the player to the game lift game session. And I'd like to say that this is just for demo purposes. You may not create game sessions this way. Maybe you created a game lobby where players choose from a list of available game sessions or something like that. It's up to you how to implement the game session creation flow and adding players to it. I just made this streamlined to keep it simple. Once we have a successful response from creating the player session, we use the response which contains the server's IP, port, and player session ID to connect to the TCP server we created above. Okay, on to the bad network client. The TCP connection is handled under the bad network client script along with the rest of the network communication and lifecycle code. Once connected, we receive data from the server in this onDataRecieved method which in turn processes all opcodes in the process message function. So here you can see the connected and start opcodes that we saw the server sending from above. This will update the Unity's client status and begin play. So let's jump over to the gameplay logic really quick. It's pretty basic. This is just a mock game that listens for the player to press W. When W is pressed, it tells our network client to send the message to our server. If we were the first one to hit W, then we win. The server will then determine the winner and loser and send out the opcodes respectively. Then the client marks the game is over. You can perform any client cleanup here. For now I just made it update the game status so that the player knows if they won or lost. The server takes care of disconnecting the server for us. The script bad network message is what gets sent back and forth between the client and server as serialized JSON. It has just two fields, player session ID and opcode, but you can expand this to include whatever you'd like. You don't even have to use JSON here, but it's what I'm familiar with. I also wanted to note that I didn't spend a lot of time on error handling as this is just a simple demo. Your production project should be a lot more hardened than this. Okay, now let's do a quick demo with the game. We can see our fleet has an active server and game instance running. Let's hit play on the Unity game client. Our editor logs indicate we've created a game session and a new player session. And then we got the connected opcode, which means we are connected through TCP to the server. If we hit refresh, you can see the new active game session. Drill down to see the active player session we just created. Okay, now let's start the other client. And now both clients should have the started status, which means the game is active and ready to play. Hit refresh and you can see the other player session is now active. I'll hit the W key here and the client running in the editor. As you can see, the win opcode message was sent to this client. Let's refresh our session again and you'll see both player sessions are now completed. Do a quick page refresh and the game session is also now completed. Note that when a game session ends, you can download the server logs from the session details page. And this whole setup is just an example of how to use the game lift APIs. You don't have to talk directly from your Unity client. You could also put a Lambda function in front of the game lift services and spin up instances as you need them. There's a lot of pieces to this video, so if I missed anything, please let me know. Thanks for watching.